Hello, this is Emily Seal. Chapter 2 of Script Analysis. Welcome back. So today we'll be looking at another one of my favorite plays, which is why I put it on the front end, <laughs> Raisin in the Sun. Uh, Lorraine Hansberry writes this play set in the 1950s in Chicago, um, very much about the civil rights movement and through the uh, tropes of the time, uh, poetic um, uh, drama. So we have uh, a lot of the same. We'll be doing some comparison when we get to Death of a Salesman about how she conforms and uh, how Arthur Miller um, breaks and some of the ways that they're writing in this poetic realism style. But <clears throat> one thing that these poetic realism playwrights did is they had what's called an extended metaphor as the title of their play. So Raisin in the Sun is a reference to a Langston Hughes poem um, about, uh, it's called A Dream Deferred. And we have um, the examples I'll use today will be from the latest movie version there with um, Sean Combs, Audrey McDonald, Felicia Rashad, these great actors. Um, but um, it's about the American dream and what happens when we have this mythos in America about what the American dream is and how you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps and if you just believe in yourself you can achieve every, anything you like, um, but how there are some innate biases inherent in the American dream. Um, you know, if you are a person of color in the 1950s, your ability to apply for a mortgage and get a mortgage are very slim, especially compared to a white man of the same era. So we're going to look at some of those inequalities today. And I think um, as we talk about given circumstances, the time, the place, uh, Raising the Sun is a great example of um, a, a nice photo of one family's experience at this time. It's deeply embedded in history, as opposed to maybe Hamlet, where we're telling a universal story that, you know, the tenant version that I encouraged you to watch was um, a high concept. It was set in a different time and place. I don't think I would ever try to stage um, Raisin the Sun in a different time and place because that play is so deeply embedded in its given circumstances. And it's the world of the play is so broad and deep and meaningful so as we talk about it today. But that Langston Hughes poem that the namesake for A Raisin in the Sun, I'm going to read that real quick. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat? or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet. Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? So that's Langston Hughes, What Happens to a Dream Deferred. So already from the very beginning, we have some strong metaphor. We have a clear um, theme or seed of, of dreaming. And every character in this play has a dream. and. Um, We'll get into that today. So putting down Raisin in the Sun and picking up our textbook, Script Analysis for Actors, Directors, and Designers, given circumstances. Viola Davis, who's one of my favorite actresses, says, well, first of all, you read the script a million times because what the script gives you are given circumstances. Given circumstances are all the facts of your character. That's obviously from her perspective as an actor. Um, but anything special conditions on stage, right? Um, and this is Stanislavski and his method really talks about the importance of mining and digging into um, the given circumstances of the play. It could be something that you just kind of take for granted, um, but when you start doing your historical research, when you start looking at the deep um, mindset that comes from a particular age. All you have to do is talk to somebody who's a different age than you and you start to see that they maybe have or maybe from a different country than you. What are their priorities? What do they value? Right? Um, we, we as individuals have things that we value but then also we as collective societies have values based on place and time. So um, we'll get into that a little bit today.
So if you're talking to a practitioner who's not coming from a more formalist analysis, who's not coming from a Stanislavski perspective, they may use a different word than Giffen circumstances. You may hear it referred to as texture or literary landscape. All of those things, social context, are what we're putting under the umbrella for the purposes of our class of given circumstances. So um, sometimes, uh, and I just feel a need to throw this out here, sometimes you have fictional places like Oz, right, where the literary landscape is freer and more open for interpretation. Um, I just closed a Midsummer Night's Dream. Once again, the literary landscape, the given circumstances, are m there's it, there are some specifics, but there's a lot of room to interpret, which is part of the reason we as designers love ta tackling something like Midsummer, um, because there is more leeway. Whereas as if I were costuming a raisin in the sun, and I'll give several examples of that today, um, there are some things that I would want to adhere to if I'm going to strictly represent the history of the time. <coughs> so there's a couple different ways that we can talk about time, and sorry, I've got a little bit of congestion. I'm an allergy kid here. Um, so there's a couple of different things that we want to look at when we consider the time of um, any given manuscript. There's a difference between the time of composition and the time in the play was set. And sometimes a playwright has an agenda. A really famous example of this might be Arthur Miller's The Crucible. He is writing about the Salem witch trials at the same time that McCarthyism is um, putting on this red scare. They're, um, have you now or have you ever been part of the Communist Party? All of those um, kind of trumped up kangaroo courts are going on and Arthur Miller is writing about the Salem witch trials as a sort of parallel for people to see. So that would be Arthur Miller's obviously writing uh, in the 1950s but the time of composition is different from the setting of the play. So what's when you start looking into what is this getting into the mind of your playwright what are they trying to do? What are they trying to communicate? And um, there's always been um, times that get romanticized, you know, like The Three Musketeers. That was a play that was written well after the actual time it was set. Phaedra by Racine, right? He's writing in France after the Renaissance, after they've discovered all these great classical Greek and Roman plays, and he's writing um, a Greek and Roman play because this classical idea of what is good art has come back. So what is it about the period that the playwright's writing about that is inspired by shared values? So for the purposes of this um, analysis, we're an, you know analyzing Raisin in the Sun, Lorraine Hansberry is writing about the um, recent past. She's writing about the time of her childhood. So she's very straightforward about the fact that this play is very autobiographical for her. So we don't have to do a lot of guesswork about what the time of composition is and why, what the connection is for that author in wanting to tell that story. I think it's interesting, just going back to this for a second, how many gothic stories we have going on right now, how much, um, you know, I've seen so many things set around the turn of the century, now that we're turning a century again, I guess we're 19 years into the new century, so it's not that much of a <laughs> new century, we're about to be in the 20s, but um, it's interesting to me the times that people choose to romanticize. So. So the time of the action, the exact time, the season, the year. So um, we have a pretty broad time for from Hansberry, she just says in the foreword, between World War II and the present. Um, so generally late 40s and um, the 1950s. That gives a director and a designer a chance to interpret that time, but almost every professional director or designer I have worked with has wanted specificity. They haven't been content to just say the 1950s. They would decide, okay, we're going to costume this in 1957, just for the sake of continuity, so that um, we have a historical basis, we have a clear expectation. Um, the civil rights were of, you know, rapidly changing in the 1950s, and this play is very much a part of that movement. Um, and when we look at the fashion between 
during World War II and after World War II, they're vastly different. Because during World War II, we had shortages of buttons, of um, fabric, we had rationing, especially in war-torn countries like London that were, um, or, you know, or Paris, these fashion-centric places were rationing their materials. And so after the war is over, we have designers like Christian Dior who are creating these lush, full of fabric skirts. This, you know, the pendulum swings the other way. We've got tons of buttons on everything just to celebrate that we're no longer in a time of scarcity. So, um, you know, I, as a costume designer, would want to say, okay, Lorraine, <laughs> let's give an exact year because the fashion is very different. But of course, we have to look at that too if we're costuming, what is the status of the people who were costuming? And all of the youngers are on a limited budget, right? Um, there's a few comments in the play about clothes. Walter Lee accuses um, Benita of being too trendy she accuses he accuses George Murchison of wearing the goofy trendy shoes but a lot of the fashion would be working class people who are wearing affordable fabrics right not the Christian Dior over the top fancy dress as you would see at the Met Gala so the time of the action is very important oh, sorry for my typo there so dramatic time this comes at it in several different ways but the the main thing that you need to know is that every scene on stage every moment should have a very specific time decided right so if i were costuming once again if it's a morning you see um ruth and walter lee are wearing their robes their pajamas and i would want to costume them thusly right and that's in the props it's in the stage direction so that's pretty clear but she doesn't give us a time of year she doesn't give us a season so i may decide for the purposes of my production to set it in the fall where i can have someone with a cardigan a light jacket but they're not going to have to be bundled up and undress every time they walk in the door they're not going to have to take off six layers Right, but there's also a formality that comes with the 1950s, right? Gloves, jackets, ties, um, people just dressed up more than they do. And even people um, who didn't have a lot of money to dress up would still have conformed. Uh, Mama Lena probably would not have gone out of the house without a hat on. It's just these formalities that come with that. So when we look at um, dramatic time, it's also about the passage of time. Right? There are those plays that are set in real time. Curtain up, right? And, and you sit there for three hours and it's happening in real time. But most plays have, especially in the Western world, that trope of when the lights go out, people change clothes. Okay, there's been a presumed passage of time. And um, we have an example in our text here. Forgive me for not having the page ready. But Ruth, um, the first moments of the play, come on now, boy, it's 7.30, right? To Walter Lee, it's after 7.30. Let me see you do some waking up in there now. So um, we have from the very lights up, the very um, first moments of the play, Lorraine Hansberry gives us a clear um, perspective on time. Now this also has to do with the genre we're dealing with. It's a realism. It's poetic realism, but it's still gritty realism. So people are going to be talking about money. They're going to be talking about time. It's going to have all of those nuances that you would expect from a, a regular everyday life of the common people. So when we look at um, analyzing a play and deciding the genre of the play, if you're dealing with something like Hamlet, they tend to be more epic. They're not going to have the gritty details, whereas a realistic play is going to give you more dramatic time. So, but it's still, you know, if you're, um, if you're a designer, a lighting designer, for, say, for example, time of day determines how it should be lit, right? If there's a window, if there's a light source, it helps um, affect the mood. So, geographical locale. So we've covered the when, and we're getting into the where, the who, what, when, where, right? Geographical locale is pretty straightforward. The country, region, or district in which the action is set, 
right and um, we're in Illinois you can see the state there in the bottom left and then we have a close-up of Chicago specifically but Chicago is a whole metropolis area but we're getting into the south side and the fictional place of Clyburn Park now when you have a fictional place you probably want to approximate it so for example um, Shakespeare loved to make up places like Illyria um, is where Twelfth Night is set and it's just sort of this mythical island in in the Mediterranean but then you if you can you want to try to approximate that with all of the landscape and um, cultural identity of a real place because that's going to give you that multi-layered um, distinct world that that frees up our imagination to create within the confines of that reality so um, Clyburn Park, Hansberry was very transparent about the fact that it was based on her personal experiences in Woodland Park. She and her um, black family moved into a white neighborhood and they were harassed in Woodland Park. So she's changed the name to protect the innocent. Uh, well, they're not innocent. Let me restate that. <laughs> she has changed the name out of her graciousness. Um, but Clyburn Park is based on Woodland Park. So we know that red dot is exactly where Woodland Park is and we can see um, relatively the kinds of houses that were there in the 1950s and what kind of place that Mama Lena would have wanted to move to. So um, setting it in a very specific locale, you know, what is, why does the playwright choose that place? Does it have a texture? Does it have um, a shared value? Um, is it Lorraine Hansberry trying to tell her story as closely as she can to the way she experienced it? So specific locale, we're talking about the scenery. We're talking about where we are. Now, I have a little disclaimer here that I've um, stolen from James Thomas. He gives us um, a little tidbit and some people when they read a play they're looking at the stage directions and they're looking at this ground plan that sometimes provided particularly for box sets or realistic plays um, less likely to see them in musicals but that doesn't mean that they're not in there but we often have ground plans in the back of a text that we're reading especially if it's an actor's edition or a production ed edition now these ground plans can free us up to just follow that basic um, you know plan that's given to us but especially if we're working with maybe a limited budget or not the same production values of I don't know a Broadway show then we're free to change that those a lot of those stage directions were written down by the first stage manager a lot of those ground plans are just the way that the first set designer decided to um, lay out the space we are in no way obligated now I think Lorraine Hansberry put Raisin in the Sun as the title of the play. We have a moment in the script when Lena is packing up her, her plant um, and taking it out of the windowsill. I do think it would be a bastardization of the text to take that moment out of the play or to take that windowsill out of the experience. But just meaning to say that when you sit down as maybe a director or an actor to, if you're not the set designer, um, try to be open to whatever you're given. Um, from the set designer. Don't just presume that what's included in the text is um, hard and fast what it's got to be. So society can be broadly defined as any group with shared behavioral standards. So obviously this play is a harsh criticism of um, segregation in America and that's the society with which the youngers are trying to survive or trying to fight against. So um, some of you have studied sociology. These terms will obviously be um, a quick, quick oversight. So the family unit is kind of the core. We see Mama Lena has just lost her husband. She had two children, Walter and Benita. We see that Walter and Ruth are married. They have one child, Travis. Benita actually has two love interests. I don't know why George didn't make it into the Cliff Notes uh, graph here. I stole from offline, <laughs> but uh, George got left out for some reason. And uh, Asagai is Benita's other 
um, romantic interest, uh, albeit Asaga is the more serious one who he actually proposes to her. Um, we can see that the one white guy in the show, Carl Linder, is the one who offers them m money not to move in. We've got um, William Bobo, Willie Harris, we never, in some editions we never actually see him, but Bobo is the friend who comes in to tell Willie, uh, to tell Walter Lee that Willie's run off with the money. So we can see different kind of relationships. I would always encourage you, especially if you're dealing with a complicated play, to sit out and create a character map. And maybe, you know, if you're dealing with a huge play like Hamlet, you don't have to put every single soldier number three on there, um, uh, unless you're the director, in which case, yes, you do, because all of those people need to be important in your mind. <laughs> but if you are, um, you know, an actor, you need to know what is the relationship between you and that person and how does it evolve over time, especially when you're dealing with a realistic play like we have for Raisin in the Sun. How does that relationship change when Carl first knocks on the door by the time he comes back the second time? How? What is his perspective? What is his clear point of view that we see from the moment that he walks in the door and how does it evolve? So um, knowing those relationships, you know, you as a person, when a friend walks in, maybe you light up. Somebody who you want to avoid walks into the room, maybe you look away. All that same nuance if you're doing a realistic play, really needs to come into the fabric, the tapestry of the play. You ought to have a clear point of view for every character. And then, especially, you know, Walter and Benita, their brother and sister. I mean, that relationship is so complicated, as all family dynamics are, right? So, um, societies include families. Families are the bedrock of any given society. And so these family dramas, um, that are, you know, like Raisin in the Sun that are happening in the 1950s and 60s are fraught with emotion and pain. Uh, we have friends. Asagai starts as a friend and becomes a lover. Um, all of these make up the society we're in. So, um, occupations. Occupations. So, you want to ask yourself what is my character chosen to do for a living? And what is their point of view within that? Now, what you choose to do for a living also becomes your default social group in a lot of ways, right? I've chosen to be a professor. I spend a lot of time with other academics, right? For better or worse. So we have our own social group um, as an academic. When I introduce myself, especially in a capitalist society like America, as a professor, people have a preconceived notion, for good or bad, about what a professor is, their status in society, um, what they think, how they think. Um, you know, if I tell them that I'm a theater teacher, uh, a lot of people are like, oh, groovy, that sounds like fun. If I tell them I'm a speech teacher, I immediately hear a story about how much, uh, how hard their speech class was or how they hate public speaking. <laughs> uh, but e there's a preconceived notion about that occupation within any given society. So when you um, are researching, especially a historical play, you want to ask yourself what exactly um, is that job and what are the connotations of having that job, right? Is he just a fisherman? Is he a king or a prince? So it, it can also clue into the value, right? Obviously, I'm an educator. I value education. I am an artist. I value art. Um, but we have here from Walter Lee this wonderful monologue. And if you will indulge me, I'm going to read it. Um, I open and close doors all day long. I drive a man around in his limousine and I say, yes, sir, no, sir, very good, sir. Shall I take the drive, sir? Mama, that ain't no kind of job. That ain't nothing at all. Mama, I don't know if you can, if I can make you understand. Sometimes it's like I can see the future stretched out in front of me, just plain as day. The future mama hanging over there at the edge of my days, just waiting for me, a big looming, blank space full of nothing just waiting for me but it don't have to be mama sometimes when I'm downtown and I pass them cool quiet looking restaurants where them white boys are sitting back and talking about things sitting there turning their de deals worth millions of dollars sometimes I see guys don't look much older than me 
and mama interrupts and says how come you talk so much about money and he says because it is life because it is life and um, when we look at um, what are their values what are they uh, we see that mama really values human life right we get into this discussion with Ruth about the baby and whether they can have the baby or not um, mama is conservative she's from the south she's raised Christian and makes a priority of getting her kids to church and the idea that Ruth would go and get an abortion from a backstreet um, alley is absolutely heartbreaking to mama right Walter Lee when he is confronted with the reality of the decision that Ruth is about to make he doesn't say anything right um, because babies cost money because they're already living in this crowded tenement apartment and so you can see their values you can see um, how they feel the clear point of view about their occupation um, is that Walter Lee d hates his job he's driving somebody else's car he feels like a second-rate citizen this is his dream is to be more his dream is to be able to have a job that um, will better his station in life but he feels hopeless and it's kind of interesting to me mama is the one character who does have hope who keeps putting herself out there Benita hopes to be a doctor um, but she's pretty cynical at the same time and and when the money goes away she questions whether she should even be doing that um, Walter Lee never got a chance to be educated and he makes fun of Benita for valuing education and spending her money on education so <laughs> that was this image I switched to real quick that probably confused you and disoriented you I'm sorry about that um, but um, social status <laughs> And the reason I have that picture up is because George, who is Benita's first suitor, who didn't make his way onto the Cliff Notes um, image there, George calls Walter Lee Prometheus. And Prometheus is a Greek figure who is tortured for eternity. You can see that eagle comes down every morning and starts eating out his liver, which in the Greek culture was the seat of emotion. And um, every morning he wakes up again and his liver is back and the eagle gets to eat it out again so every day is torture for Prometheus and um, Marxist uh, economy um, theories uh, talked a lot about Prometheus as the working man an analogy for the working man and of course Walter Lee doesn't understand George's reference to Prometheus and uh, it goes over his head and he gets angry about it he's already angry um, but I do think that Hansberry is bringing up this image just to further push the point that Walter Lee feels stuck and Walter Lee is in a tortured situation. He's in a society that doesn't value him and that he has very little hope of, of bettering himself, right? So when one of the most torturous moments in the play when Walter Lee finds out that the money is gone that his friend has betrayed him and he says that money is made out of my father's flesh we just have this gritty gruesome um, way that he feels about the cost that a working class experience is right when you have to give up your time with your family when you have to give up your energy and and mama paints the portrait of her husband growing thin before he's 40 coming down um, after his job with his eyes on the rug you know she's talking about his demeanor that he was just um, worked to death worked to death and that that money that came um, in after he died was what her husband was worth just this horrible depiction of what it meant to be a working class person in a culture that was so unjust so um, obviously social status of Hamlet he's the prince he's the person that people are thinking of as the the height of what it means to be great and that's sort of the difference we have between a lot of classical plays and more realistic plays the realism in the last century often focuses on 
the common man. But when Shakespeare talked about the common man, it was they were the butt of the joke. They were the nurse in Romeo and Juliet. They were Falstaff in Henry V. They were these ridiculous working class people as opposed to the one that we follow through the story, the hero who was usually royalty. So we have a flip on its head for for Raisin in the Sun and um, it's one of my beefs with Shakespeare but I digress. So social status and status can be lowered at any time. Somebody loses their job right that moment when Walter Lee almost loses his job for not going into work he's you know drunk at a bar early in the morning and uh, your status can be lowered or raised right based on any moment in the play and we'll talk a lot about that if you haven't already had an acting class about status so we look at these little torturous moments and um, and how they torture Walter and how money is a constant reminder for him and you know in the 1950s gender conformity you know Walter gets up in the morning and he says you know you looked young there for a second so Ruth's um, not tortured by her vocation seemingly um, but there is this emphasis on her appearance whereas Walter it's more on his money um, just to uh, clarify there so Travis um, is supposed to have 50 cents for a field trip and he begs his mama he begs his mama and she just says we don't have it right we don't have it and when Walter gets out of the shower he comes in and let me read more exhaustively here um, Travis says I have to she won't give me 50 cents Walter says why not Ruth says because we don't have it Walter says what you going to tell a boy that for here son hands him the coin thanks daddy right in fact Walter says here's another 50 cents buy yourself some fruit today take a taxi cab to school or something Travis says whoopee right and then he sends Travis out the door a few pages later when Walter's about to step out um, he goes to Ruth and says I need some money for car fare guess how much he needs 50 cents and she smart aleck that she is says here take a taxi right so Walter is ashamed that he can't afford to give his son the money for a field trip just a little thing that he's expected in his everyday life to be able to provide for his son and he has a deep shame and that's one thing um, that I think the Poitier version <laughs> um, he we see him wrestle with his shame in a way that's really visible and maybe a little bit melodramatic to our modern eye but I think it's an important part of telling um, the agony of Walter Lee I was watching the AMC um, behind the scenes sort of kind of intro that they do and uh, Poitier thought that Walter Lee was the protagonist and then the actress um, forgive me for forgetting her name who plays Mama Lena thought that she was the protagonist so even these great minds even these award-winning uh, Broadway actors turned film actors um, argued about script analysis and dramaturgy you know they had their own sort of ideas and you know to a certain extent I think that is egos of actors coming in I'm the protagonist no I'm the protagonist but I do think um, I'm gonna side with Poitier here that he is the one being tortured he is Prometheus he is um, stuck in this reality of uh, not that of course Mama Lena was also oppressed but um, uh, he's the true raisin in the Sun when we look at the journey from the beginning of the play to the end of the play and in between he has the most change so that's what I'm gonna put my money on is who the protagonist is so when we look at social standards right of any given culture in which the play is occurring social standards are shared beliefs and behaviors um, probably um, obviously I have a, a picture down there of Lindler uh, Linder Lindner sorry I started to say Lindler he's Lindner um, you know he comes in and he says uh, well I don't understand why you people are reacting this way what do you think you're gonna do gain by moving into a neighborhood where you just aren't wanted and where some elements well people can get awful worked up when they feel like their whole way of life and everything they've worked for is threatened you can't just force people to change their hearts son says Lindler and um, 
Lindner comes from a patriarchal um, white uh, supremacist. That's uh, white supremacy is his mindset, and that's his beliefs and behaviors. And the people that he uh, spends time with are all white supremacists. And so when they see black people moving into their neighborhood, uh, their default knee jerk is to exclude and to try to buy them out and get them out. Um, when we look at Asagai, and he accuses Benita of um, also being a white supremacist of of mutilating her hair. So Asagai, I'm going to read directly from the script here. I shall have to teach you about how to drape it properly, talking about these African garments, right? You wear it well, very hair, well, mutilated hair and all. Benita says, what's wrong with my hair? Asagai says, were you born with it like that? Benita says, no, of course not. Asagai says, how then? Benita says, you know perfectly well how. It's crinkly as yours, that's how. Asagai, and is it ugly to you that way? Oh, no, it's not ugly. It's just hard to manage and it's raw. Asagai, and so to accommodate that, you mutilate it every week. Benita, it's not mutilation, right? And then they get into this whole question um, and skipping down here, it's true that it's not much, not so much a profile of a Hollywood queen as perhaps a queen of the Nile. But what does it matter? Assimilationism is so popular in your country, Benita says. I am not an assimilationist, right? And Asagai says such a serious one, right? And he changes the the uh, subject uh, altogether. But assimilation. Is, is the idea that a, a subculture feels the pressure to conform to a dominant culture, right? And so um, Asagai, and this was a big part of the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s, uh, up until today, uh, you know, things like Kwanzaa were created to um, celebrate a subculture as opposed to accepting a different culture to conform to a dominant culture. So um, we see uh, Benita kind of struggling with that, and we see, um, I think, Lorraine Hansberry, uh, if you look at the picture that I showed earlier, you know, she straightens her hair. But I think these are, are questions that she's wrestling with as a person of color in America. How do we reignite um, a strong sense of self? How do we get away from the shame that Walter Lee feels and um, create a sense of cultural identity and pride that serves as an opposite to that? So, um, and then obviously, uh, Mamalina comes from a Southern culture, from a more Christian dominant, and then Benita is, is a scientist, and we'll come back to that in just a second. So, money, money, money is a huge theme in Raisin in the Sun. In America, obviously, we have a capitalistic society, but then we have these small scale financial transactions. And forgive my grainy picture of Mama Lena opening the check there, um, but that's just a powerful moment of her being empowered by this money. Uh, because in America, in the 1950s, it would be very hard for the youngers to get a mortgage to lo be loaned money as people of color in the 1950s, right? So for them to have that money to pay cash for this house, to pay the mortgage down payment without having to um, get a loan was a huge ticket out of um, the slums, out of this less than ideal living environment, right? So what are the, um, what are the small financial transactions? Now, once again, if you're looking at a play like Hamlet, we know that the Prince of Denmark is not hankering for money. He doesn't sit around and ask and worry about money the way that the youngers does, uh, that the youngers do, right? He He's a prince. That's not on his, his scale, right? Not what he's worried about. So, politics and law, right? Governmental institutions, activities that lead... Uh, that have rules of conduct, legislation, political authority. So we can say that a raisin in the sun is a indictment in a lot of ways 
of uh, white supremacy, of corrupt actions that were happening through landlords, um, through slumlords, uh, redlining, um, the way that the corrupt financial mapping was happening, the displacement of people of color. There's just a whole um, well of um, institutional racism that happens through land deals. And um, she doesn't go in and talk a lot about the po politics of it. Um, she more tells it through the story of one personal experience, and, and as she said, her personal experience of moving into a white suburbs. We see that the man who comes to them, who is a white supremacist, who says, you know, please don't move in, he, um, he doesn't uh, come with any kind of legal action. Right, he he just comes as just try to do this this handshake. But we also see that Walter Lee doesn't feel like he'll be approved for a liquor license. Right, that you have to know the right people. That there's this um, boys club about getting license, for example, for the for the liquor. And so whether that's perceived reality or um, was a sensible thing for Walter Lee to believe, we can't be sure. We know that there were roadblocks for entrepreneurs and that that's part of the story that Lorraine Hansberry is telling. So, so there are always tastemakers in any society. Tastemakers. People who have... Um, create what is fashionable, who create um, what are the ideal beauties, right? Rococo has this nice lovely plump ladies um, and what is the aesthetic, right? And when we looked at Hamlet we saw that a big part of the tastemaker for him was the University of Wittenberg. These high-minded ideas, these great minds had in, put in him this idea of intellect. And we've already kind of exhausted how um, it, it, it's in his, we've already kind of explained how school and, and kind of covered that and the way that Thomas kind of puts this in his book is, hold on, I'm kind of flipping to that page here. Um, the customary beliefs, all of that we've kind of already covered, but the excellence of taste and intellectual and aesthetic training. So in Raisin in the Sun, we already see that Walter Lee is denied the experience. The picture that I have here of, um, of Mama is because he goes in the, in the book and says that while she doesn't have a formal education, that she has a lot of perceptiveness and she's able to see like this relationship between Walter Lee and um, Ruth is falling apart. She, she's wise beyond her weir years, which comes into the spirituality of the play. Um, is there any kind of formal religion in the play that you're studying? And um, in what ways do people either conform or rebel against that formal religious training? Obviously, Mama Lena is our very... Um, turning to the page here. Mama Lena is our very religious figure. And um, in 1-1, one, one, we have this conversation beneath between Benita and Mama Lena. And Benita is studying science. I have a picture there of the Snopes monkey trial that happened, albeit in the 1920s here in Tennessee, but it was representative of this larger conflict between scientists and religion, evolution and um, creationists. There was just sort of this dichotomy between the two camps. And so Benita coming out against God um, was very much probably part of her scientific training at the university. Mama, you don't understand. It's all a matter of ideas. God is just simply one idea I don't accept. There simply is no blasted God. There is only man. And it is he who makes miracles. Mama slaps her across the face. Now you say after me, in m mother's house there is still God. And Benita says after her, in my mother's house, there is still God. Mom makes it clear that she made a priority of getting her kids to church every Sunday. So that becomes part of the the matriarchal society also being one that is 
Christ-centric that is, um, you know, the idea that you would kill your child, obviously, the rules of the house. And she even says several times to Walter Lee, you know, not while you're under my roof. She has this very staunch, um, and she is the tastemaker. She is the... Um, the governor of her own system. Now, some people would argue when I say that it's a matriarchal system that the moment that that Mama Lena decides to give the money to Walter Lee and says, "You be the man of this household," that he is then, you know, it's a patriarchal system again, and he's the one with the power and he's the one with the authority. But it is funny in those moments when he gets the money, how he parrots back to Mama Lena and says to her what she wants to hear. Uh, I think he truly believes it and what he says in front of Travis is the right thing to say. You know, he pulls he pulls all the right answers back and um and and becomes the man that we know that he is. And in a lot of ways, you know, I don't think I think that the play is a drama, but I don't think it's a tragedy. At the end of the story, we see that Walter Lee has a new home to go to, that the youngers are in a different place than they were before, that he has renamed himself his father's child. And you know, we don't we don't talk enough about the mourning process that Walter Lee must be going through. You know, he's only 33 and he's lost his father. And so how is this transformation of him becoming um, the head of his household, of him redesigning who he is, um, how much of that is part of his grief and the, you know, kind of blood money that he gets from all this. And so you can tell I'm impassioned talking about this play, can't you? I I love... um, how it captures how one woman is kind of given this platform to tell this story. You know, Lorraine Hansberry, as a person of color, as a young woman, you know, she died tragically young. Um, and and if you want to know more about her life, I recommend uh, to be young, gifted, and black. She was given this platform through art. She wouldn't have been able to get time on television. She would not have been able to uh, step up into most churches and preach, but she's, through her art form, she's really been able to tell her story and um, tell it through this fictionalized family, but also to um, give so much dignity to people in poverty. Uh, It's part of the reason I love the Harry Potter series, (laughs) because I grew up a poor kid myself, and the Weasleys are my spirit. Uh, They, you know, represent and give dignity to people in poverty and um, I, I like uh, Lorraine Hansberry for the same reason and of course I can't understand what it was like to be a person of color in the 1950s and I grieve for that America and I work towards uh, a better America so all right well thank you for listening I know it's been a heavy one um, but hopefully it's been a lot of review for you about the different ways to analyze um, given circumstances and social constructs um, for some plays this can be pretty easy um, to sort of that are they're embedded in history and please 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 don't let the history or the cultural research go um, amiss because it's a huge part of telling the story this telling it in a certain time and in a certain place, giving it full detail. So uh, if you haven't already, make sure to get into the discussions and go take the assessment. Um, Thank you so much for listening.